Okay, as we think about the next person that we can use as a counselor is the preacher. Here's a little cartoon, though, the way sometimes people want to use the preacher. There's the Lockhorns. They're coming out of services, and Mrs. Lockhorn says, Wonderful sermon. You certainly have my husband's number. So many times this is the way wives think, Well, the preacher would just preach a sermon, but I have news for you. Sermons don't do the job when marriages are desperate. They may do the job if there's a good marriage, but they don't do the job when there's desperate marriages. There's a man, a man that can have a desperate marriage, and he can sit there and listen to a sermon, and he says, yeah, that's good preaching, but then he doesn't realize that it applies to him. And I've seen this many, many times, or else he'll straighten up for a little while because that's reminded him of some things, and then he just goes right back to the way he was because he hasn't put any mental effort into it and hasn't become sanctified. So just hearing one sermon doesn't do the job. Yet preachers do have a responsibility as far as being counselors is concerned. And let's turn over to Titus 2, verses 1 through 2. And notice, first of all, the preacher's relationship to older men. men. In Titus 2, verses 1 through 2, it says, talking to, he says, But as for you, talking to the preacher Titus, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, and in perseverance. Of course, the word we're going to notice up here a little bit is sensible, that the older men are to be sensible. Then in verses 6 and 8, it gets the young men. He says, Likewise, urge the young men to be sensible. In all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity in doctrine dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, in order that the opponent may be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. So he says, preacher, you teach the young men to be sensible, and then you be an example of what it is to be a Christian life. So first of all, he tells the the preacher um, to urge the young men. Urge or exhort, as some of your translations uh, say, is a very broad word which refers to a large range of addressing and speaking to someone. So urge and exhort can come about in many different ways, is what it's saying. It includes to admonish, beg, entreat, encourage, and strengthen, instructing, or teaching. And what is the preacher to teach the young men and the old men to do? To be sensible. This word sensible means to be of sound mind, i.e. to be in one's right mind, to exercise self-control, think of oneself soberly, to curb one's passions. Now when you think about this in regard to a man's role, he's to be in his right mind, he's to have a sound mind, but he's to exercise self-control, Think of himself soberly. You know, talk about husbands. I'm the boss. I get to do everything uh, my way. There's problems that prone to selfishness. We've talked about that before. And then to curb one's passions. Really, this word sensible includes just about everything uh, that a man is involved in. If a man is sensible in his daily life, whether it's his relationship with his wife or his relationship with his boss at work or his relationship with his children, then he's a man who is in control uh, in his life. So this is what the young men and the older men are to be taught. One of the main problems that preachers have, though, is that many times wives hide the facts. When wives hide the facts, then this prevents preachers from developing insights. One lady told me that she was talking to an older preacher who had been preaching for about 40 years, and she asked him if he had ever dealt with a case of wife abuse or incest. And he told her no. He says, surely there must be cases like that out there, but no one had ever come and talked to him about these things. Yet these are things that are very prevalent. And so this man had no experience, no insights in dealing with these problems simply because wives were uh, covering them up. So what a wife is going to have to do is is to be sure that she uh, lets the preacher know exactly what's going on so that he can help. Sometimes people think, well, if the preacher would just teach some classes on marriage, that would solve all my problems. It would be nice if that were true, but we all know as we've been coming to these classes that there have been certain women that we thought needed to come to these classes, that especially needed these classes. And some of us have made some efforts to get some of these women to come, and all we have done is succeeded in making them mad. And for the 20 years that I have been teaching these classes, I always have someone at every class come up and say, I tried to get my neighbor, or I tried to get my friend, or I tried to get my sister to come, and all it did was make her mad. And so it seems that the people that need the information in the classes the worst many times are the ones that are the hardest to get to take advantage of that material. So just teaching classes and making classes available is not the answer to desperate marriages where a husband is involved in sin. 
Uh, I know one congregation that has had, over the years, have had very good classes where the preacher has taught in-depth uh, material for the men. They have brought other preachers in to have series for the men. And yet that congregation has the greatest percentage of desperate problems in it than any congregation I know of. And these are men who have sat through these classes as young men, but they didn't learn because, uh, and I don't know why, except, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, in the book of Proverbs all the, all the teaching that is directed to the man in the sexual realm. It's saying, learn. Young men, learn. Young men, pay attention to what I'm saying. The book of Proverbs just pleads with men to learn. And I think men have a different attitude toward learning than women do. Uh, this is evident if you're going to write a book and you want to be a good seller, you write your self-help, self-help books to women. You don't write them to men because women buy the largest percentage of self-help books. There's just a different attitude towards learning and towards helping. So this is not the, the solution to desperate problems. Probably what needs to be happen on desperate problems is that there needs to be a one-on-one confrontation where the preacher says, I'm talking to you, I'm talking about you. The person says, no, I don't. The preacher can say, yes, you do. Here is examples of how you're involved in this. And the best person to start this confrontation is the wife, to approach her husband and to say, you're involved in sin, this is not right, I'm not going to ignore it any longer, and if you don't straighten up, if you don't sanctify yourself and take care of the sin, then I am going to call in witnesses. And if she chooses to to select the preacher for one of those witnesses, or the elders, we're going to talk about the elders a little bit later, whoever she can choose, whoever she wants, but she wants to choose a qualified counselor to come in then the wife is the one to start the confrontation because she knows what's going on. She knows the sins that are being committed and that she can bring this about. Now, she should not be like one woman. We we worked at one congregation for several years, and when we uh, left there, this woman came and talked to me, and she said that all the years that we were there, her husband was a verbal abuser. He was a very bad verbal abuser. When he would get too bad, she would tell him, all right, I'm going to go talk to Sam, meaning my husband. I'm going to go talk to the preacher. And she said he'd immediately straighten up for a little while, be good for a little while. Then when he'd get better, she'd say, okay, I'm going to go talk to Sam. And he'd get better again. So the whole time we were there, it was just this up and down, up and down, up and down. And she never did go talk to Sam. The husband never did get sanctified. All he did was get a threat and so what she should have done if, if he got better so that she wouldn't go talk to Sam is she should have said, okay, if you don't become sanctified, if you don't start studying, if you don't change your way of thinking so that this problem doesn't just come around and we go through this cycle all the time, I'm going to follow through and go talk to Sam or go talk to whoever. So uh, the preacher, he can only help uh, if he is allowed to help in this realm. Okay, another person that makes a good counselor is elders or men who are working towards being elders who are developing the qualifications for elders. In 1 Timothy 3, verses 4 through 5, in the qualifications for an elder, in 1 Timothy 3, verses 4 through 5, it says an elder must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? So an elder is one who is to have good qualities as far as his relationship with his wife. He is to know how to help other people in these areas. And so he should be a good person for, a person to go to for counseling and for advice. Uh, Another good uh, person to go to, good counselor, would be deacons or men who are working towards being deacons. In 1 Timothy 3, verses 12 through 13, Here it says, let deacons be husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children and their own households. So deacons likewise are to be men who are not verbal abusers or not physical abusers. They know how to have these characteristics and they are able to deal with other people. Okay, another uh, counselor that we can go to is that of qualified older women. In Titus 2, verses 3 through 5. In Titus, we got the uh, young men, we got the old men, and now we're going to get the older women and then the young women. In Titus 2, verses 3 through 5, it says, 
Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, not enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be dishonored. So when a woman's children leave home and she has more time, then God wants her to be a teacher of young women. He wants her to be involved uh, in this uh, in this work. And this word, uh, teach, uh, it really means, and my translation says encourage, uh, it's encourage to be sober or teach to be sober is all uh, one word that they're in, involved in. And it's the same word that we looked at to, for sensible for the older men and sensible for uh, the young men to think properly. And it's not talking about teaching like what I'm doing, but it's talking about uh, this word up here. We have up here to train the young women means to make one, restore one to his senses or his duty, to admonish, to exhort earnestly. So it's something that can be done on a one-to-one basis or can be done in a class. How it is done is not in that word. But because the King James translates it teach, many times women think it's talking about teaching a public class. And it is not talking about that. It's talking about uh, admonishing, exhorting earnestly, to restoring one to his senses. Uh, This is something that may have to be done on an individual basis. So certain qualified older women, and they are good counselors. And I want you to notice the qualities of these older women. First of all, it says they are reverent in behavior. This word is all one word. Reverent in behavior means befitting men, places, actions, or things sacred to God. Reverent. That means that a woman understands her relationship to men, places, and things. She's got subjection under her belt. She understands it. She understands her relationship to men, places, and things, and and to God. So she's someone who has this knowledge and this understanding. Now, I want you to to realize that reverence in behavior doesn't require that she have a believing husband or believing children. These are qualifications of the elders. The elders have to have a believing believing wife and believing children, but this is not a characteristic of a woman who can be a good counselor. What she has to have is the reverent attitude. Now, if a woman had to have the right kind of husband, and the right kind of children, this would rule out Abigail. And yet God said she was prudent. She had good understanding. So a woman can have a husband who's not a Christian. She can have a husband who's not living right, a husband who's been disfellowshipped. And she can be this this kind of a person. She can have this right uh, kind of <coughs> attitude. Uh, there's a lady that really illustrates uh, this point well, I think. This lady that I think is a modern-day uh, Abigail. This lady, I met her Oh, I see. It must be uh, about three years ago, I guess now. And uh, this lady, uh, her husband called my husband up, and they was when we still were living at, at uh, Seattle, at Southwest, and they were lived in California. And so uh, we had never met either one of them, and the husband had been listening to some of my husband's tapes, and he called him up, and he says, I want to come do some studying with you. Can I bring my travel trailer, and my wife and I come up and study with you? My husband says, yes, you can come, but I want you to know that my wife's uh, writing a book right now, and she doesn't have a lot of time to entertain your wife, so can your wife entertain herself? And so the man says, yeah, that won't be a problem. So they came on up to where we were in Seattle to see us. I had written volume two, and we had sent it off to the printer to be printed, and we were expecting it to come any day, and I was revising volume one of my books. And so while these people were there, and this lady was, she was very nice, and uh, she told me, she says, I'll just sit here on the divan and uh, read. You go downstairs and, and work and don't worry about me. So I was able to go ahead and do the things that I needed to do. But that afternoon, while they were there, uh, the truck drives up in our driveway with a load of uh, volume two books. And of course, this is what we've been very eagerly and very excited about uh, coming. And so here are the books come in. Oh, and I guess I neglected to tell you that this lady is 82 years old. And her husband is is a little bit younger than she is, too, but he's an older man, too. So here's this older couple in our home, and here come these books, Volume 2, Learning to Love, God's People Make the Best Lovers. Well, we're excited. We have to open up a a box to see what the books look like. Of course, they're excited with us, and they want to see these books. And so after we see them a little bit, and I need to go back down and work, she says, Oh, just give me one of your books. And she says, I'll just sit in here and read it, and you go back on downstairs and work. I thought, Oh. 
This lady's 82. What's she going to think of this book? Is she going to think that I'm just some kind of horrible, shameless person because she's probably all Victorian and this kind of a person? You know, but, but what could I do? I mean, here's the books. I can't snatch it out of her hand and say, you can't read it. Or, so I thought, man, I'm stuck. So I give her a book, and I go downstairs, and I work for a little while. A little bit later, I come upstairs, and I walk through the room, and she motions for me. Come here. Thought, oh, no, here it's going to happen. She says, I've been reading your book, and she says, first of all, I want you to know that I agree with everything you say so far, but she says, I have a question for you. She says, where did you learn these things? She says, I had to learn these things, but she says, I want to know where you learned them. She says, my first husband, when I married my first husband, I'd only been married to him about two months when she contracted a venereal disease. He took her to the doctor. She got that treated. A few months later, another venereal disease. And this is when she discovers that he is a womanizer. And she says, I had to learn these things because of the man that I was living with. I had to learn uh, how to please him, I had to learn uh, about this relationship. Well, what ended in their marriage is he would, he would come home for a while, and then he'd leave, be out with women, then he'd come home for a while, and then he'd be out with women. They ended up getting a divorce, and they stayed divorced then for I don't know how many years until he was about to die. And then he wanted, he says, Mama, can I come home? He wanted to come home and die. And she says, no, you can't come home because you're already married to another woman and that wouldn't be right for you to, to come home. And so he died. And then later, this fellow that was with her now that she was married to now, then his wife died and they had been neighbors and had known each other all these years and they uh, had gotten married. So, so they were now married. And so she pointed to her husband that was sitting there in the dining room studying with my hus husband and she says, my husband really needs this book of yours. She said his first wife was very Victorian and very cold and said so she didn't know how to love him. And we've really had some, had to have some conversations about this subject. She says, I think your book will really help him. And so here's this 82 year old woman telling me that my book about sex is going to help her 70 some year old husband be, be a better lover. And so anyway, so she told me, she says, I've had to learn these things. And she says, over the years, a lot of other women have criticized me because I have taught these things to, to young women. But she says, I just feel so strongly that young women need uh, to know these things, that they need to know about the sexual relationship so that it can protect them and so that they can satisfy their husbands. So here's a woman that maybe by our standards, uh, we might not think she was qualified to be a, a teacher of young women, but yet this woman had a tremendous reputation in the congregation where she was. She was always having people over to her house to listen to tapes. She was always getting in Bible discussions with, with preachers and with other people and teaching people. She had a tremendous reputation as being a very godly woman. And she had one of the most beautiful attitudes that you've ever seen. She had this miserable marriage, but did she let it make her bitter? No, she was one of the most pleasant ladies imaginable. In fact, she, since I was busy working, she took my uh, son, Wesley, who must have been, what, about five years old at that time, took him out to their camper and let him practice driving and just doing all sorts of things. And while she was there, he w he uh, jumped off the side of the, the house, had a brick, or not a brick, but a stone retaining wall, and he jumped off of it. So here's this 82-year-old lady that thinks she can jump off of it, too. So she jumps off of it and falls and ended up breaking her thumb. But anyway, this was the kind of person she was. She was just a real upbeat lady. And my husband said, boy, says, the way you see that old man, look at that old lady, his eyes just sparkle. She just knows how to satisfy him and how to fulfill his needs. But yet, by our standards, we might not think she was qualified to teach the young women, but she had this reverent attitude. She had men, places, and things in proper perspective. And her attitude towards her first husband all these years were, she just wanted him to be a Christian. She just wanted him to, to go to heaven, and if he would do that, then she would be happy. But of course, that was something that he never did. But when we think about using the older women, qualified older woman as a, as a counselor, Maybe the reason that she knows as much as she does to help us in certain areas is because of the problems that she's faced, like this woman. She's had to learn. She's been for forced to learn them. And if her attitude is right, that she's a submissive woman, she's got men, places, and things in the right perspective, then she has this quality that doesn't require that her children or her husband be uh, perfect specimens of Christians. Then she's not to be a malicious gossip. Of course, this is an obvious characteristic. A malicious gossip means accusing falsely, and it comes from a word which means devils. If she's a malicious gossip, then she's not going to be keeping private things private. Uh, this is a, just another way also of, of saying she doesn't judge motives. 
a woman who judges motives. We've, we've talked over and over about what a serious problem this is in marriages, how it magnifies its problems. Well, if she's got this characteristic of where she judges motives, then really she's not capable of helping anyone because this is a very basic problem. She's not enslaved to much wine. We've talked about it in earlier classes. Who has the strife? Who has woes? People that are enslaved to wine can't think properly. So she's got self-control and she's not, uh, her thinking isn't muddled by wine. Then she is teaching what is good. She's teaching young women. Maybe she's saying, uh, don't do this with your children. Don't do this with your husband because I learned the hard way it doesn't work. But she's teaching what is good, what God would have them do. So qualified older women can be a counselor. Then another group of women that can be good counselors are qualified widows. And let's turn over to 1 Timothy 5, verses 9 through 10. 1 Timothy 5, verses 9 through 10. And this whole section here is talking about widows, but we want to notice a special class of widows in verse 9. It says, Let a widow be put on the list only if she's not less than 60 years old, having been the wife of one man, having a reputation for good works, and if she's brought up children, if she's shown hospitality to strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has, has assisted those in distress, and if, if she has devoted herself to every good work, but refused to put younger widows on the list, for when they feel sensual desires and disregard to Christ, they want to get married. This word list here means properly to lay down, to narrate at length, to recount or to set forth. Then the third meaning is to set down in a list or register to enroll especially uh, soldiers, like you're, you're registering soldiers and getting a list of soldiers. Then Thayer says in his commentary about this particular verse, what this word means, it's of those widows who held a prominent place in the church and exercised a certain superintendence over the rest of the women and had charge of the widows and orphans supported at public expense. So what this verse is talking about is that it is honorable and noble for a church to support, or I might use the word hire, qualified widows to do work for that church. And there are lots of jobs that uh, these type of widows, widows who do not have a husband to take their time, whose children are grown, then they have time to devote to serving God, they have time to devote to teaching the young women. And this is really, uh, these, these qualifications of her, they take into account all the qualifications of the older woman we just saw, plus they are more specified. She's not less than 60 years old, uh, so she is uh, at least 60 years old. She's the wife of one man. She has a reputation for good works. She's brought up children. She's shown hospitality to strangers. And again, this has nothing to do with whether her husband is a Christian, uh, what kind of a person he is. It has nothing to do with how her children have turned out. It's just that she had this experience. She's shown hospitality to strangers. She's washed the saints' feet. And you remember when Jesus washed the disciples' feet, the significance of that was he was humbling himself. He was teaching them about humility and about subjection. Uh, she's been willing to do the, the menial, least important jobs. Whatever needed to be done, she's willing to do it. She's assisted those in distress. She's been devoted to every good work. You have a woman that has all these qualifications. Then when she's a widow, for her to be put on the church's payroll where she is working more or less full-time, teaching the young women, assisting those in distress, working with other widows, then you have a very valuable, a very special worker in that congregation. And this is something that I think if we saw more congregations doing, then I think congregations would be generally more healthy in the relationship that people have uh, to their marriages. Okay, then as we continue after seeing the list of different kinds of counselors, I want us to talk about some guidelines for counseling. The first number one goal of the counselor should be that that counselor is going to bear fruit. In John 15, verse 8, just a general principle in John 15, verse 8, here he says, By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Many times when we're involved in counseling, we need to ask ourselves the question, am I bearing fruit as I am working with this individual, or am I just using up my time and taking my time away from more productive things? Because this is a serious problem that counselors uh, run into. Right before my husband started preaching, we had occasion to uh, 
assist a, another preacher as he and his wife were counseling a young couple and to observe the way that preacher was doing. Uh, this preacher and his wife were assisting a young couple that at the time I did not know it, but as I look back on it and realize, remember things that were said and done, I am convinced that it was a case of wife abuse where the husband was probably verbally, uh, there was probably verbal abuse on both sides, both the husband and the wife, and there was probably some physical abuse going on. But at that time, I was too naive uh, to realize that that was the situation. But anyway, this preacher and his wife spent a tremendous amount of time with this young couple. And this young couple had two small children. They would babysit their children for them. And they would tell this young couple, you can kill each other if you want to, but don't you dare harm those babies. We love those babies. That this young couple would call them in the middle of the night because they were having some kind of a fight and they wanted the preacher to come referee this fight uh, for them. And we watched this preacher when we when we left that area and my husband started preaching. This preacher had been working for this with this couple for about three years and nothing had changed. They were just staying the same. They they were just continually refereeing fights, trying to protect the children from getting killed if the parents killed each other. About two years later, after five years of working with this couple. Uh, this this uh, family uh, was involved in a car accident where the man was killed, and the wife and the two children escaped entry, and the man died. Now, this preacher had to preach that funeral, and after he preached that funeral, he was so upset because he had absolutely no confidence that this man had gone to be with God. He had no confidence whatsoever that this man was pleasing to God when he died. And so, so, so when he died... And he died in that state. This so upset this preacher that the following Sunday he could not do his job. He said he got up that Sunday, he didn't shave, he put on an old pair of blue jeans, and he went to some congregation a long ways off just to, so that he was worshiping, but yet he was so torn up mentally. The woman, what happened to her was she became a prostitute. And it was as if that preacher and his wife, they had spent five years laboring and working and trying to help that family. And it was as if they had not accomplished anything except torn themselves up emotionally and spent a lot of time with them. They bore no fruit with that couple. So my husband and I, when he first started preaching, we looked at that example and we said, what can we learn from that? How can we keep from investing five years into somebody and not having anything to show for it except we're emotionally and physically worn out? And so seeing that example has had a tremendous impact on the way I have dealt with people, the way my husband has dealt with people. Yet we've made mistakes, as I told you about the family from uh, Canada, we made mistakes with them and we let that go on uh, too long. But yet it is impressed upon me that God tells us to bear fruit and we have to look at situations and we have to make judgment calls on whether certain things are going to bear fruit. And what we're going to be talking about in the rest of our time is how to bear fruit, how to keep from getting trapped into a situation like that where we are not helping the person, we're just letting it to go on. The first thing that we want to notice is we have to learn to say no. And I'm not going to take time to read all these verses because you know this parable in Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. This is the story of the ten virgins. Five were wise and five were foolish. But they went to meet the bridegroom, and the five wise took enough oil. But the five foolish did not take enough oil. So halfway there, the five foolish's lamps uh, uh, the, the oil and the, their lamps burn out. And so they asked the five wise virgins if they would give them some oil. The five wise virgins says, no, we will not share our oil with you unless we do not, lest we do not have enough to get there ourselves. The five wise virgins recognized their limitations and they protected their limitations. They knew when to say, uh, no. You know, if I had been back there and it had been one of those five wise virgins that had enough oil with me, and one of the foolish virgins had come to me and says, give me some oil, you know what I would have done? I would have shared, I would have divided my oil between myself and the five other foolish virgins, and we all would have been out of oil just a little bit later, and it would have been the story of the four wise virgins and the six foolish uh, virgins if I had been there. And many times this is what counselors do. They do not look at their own spiritual needs, their own physical needs. They don't look at their own family's needs, and they don't know when to say no. So we have to learn when to say no and to protect our own self spiritually so that we don't lose our soul through burnout with working with other people. Which brings us to the next point. And that is we need to avoid 
unstable, double-minded people. Because these are the kind of people that you do not bear fruit with. In Proverbs 24, verse 21, in Proverbs 24, verses 21 through 22, here it says, My son, fear the Lord and the King. Do not associate with those who are given to change, for their calamity will rise suddenly, and who knows the ruin that comes from both of them. So if you associate with people given to change, then he says they're going to have calamity, and who knows the ruin that's going to come to them. Notice this word, associate. It's a really interesting word, I think. Associate or meddle, as the King James says, means to braid, to intermix, to engage, intermeddle with, mingle self. So, so he's saying you don't intermix yourself. You don't braid yourself in with. You don't mingle yourself in with uh, these people who are given to change. Notice what change means. To fold, i.e. duplicate, literally or figuratively, by implication to transmute, to do, speak, strike again, alter, double, be given to change, disguise, be diverse, pervert, prefer, repeat, return, do a second time. Now, anybody that's ever been involved with other people, very many times you know that there are people like this out there. That there are people that, that, that want you to braid your life in with their life. They want you to be there to always to call them, to always encourage them, to always jack them up. They're faithful as long as other Christians are calling them and jacking them up. But the one time you don't uh, call them, then it's as if nothing has ever been accomplished with them. They are back to, to square one. They have to do it a second time. You're continually at square one teaching them the same thing over and over and over again. This was the problem with this preacher and his wife with this young couple for five years. They were continually doing the same thing over and over and over with them. They had no fruit to show uh, for five years. I had a friend uh, in Spokane who had a neighbor like this. <clears throat> she's trying to teach her neighbor, which was something that was honorable. But this neighbor had some marriage problems, and she's trying to help her with her marriage problems. And she was continually going over to my friend's house to have her talk her out of bad attitudes, to have her settle fights for her. She's calling her in the middle of the night to settle fights for her. And this, this neighbor, uh, this friend of mine, worked with her for several years and never accomplished one thing with her. The lady came to the ladies' classes we were having. But she wouldn't do the homework. All she wanted to do was listen and have somebody jack her up. And as long as someone was jacking her up, okay. But there was never any substance, never anything of her own. And she was never able to do anything of her own. In James 1, verses 6 through 8, tells us the same essential principle. <clears throat> In James chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. Okay, here he says, <clears throat> but let them ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in his ways. Notice that double-minded means double-minded, wavering, uncertain, doubting, divided in interest. And he is unstable, he's unstable, inconstant, restless. And so really what's happening here with this double-minded person, God says, don't expect anything from God because you're this way. Yet we many times are willing to expend all kinds of energy and time with people like this. And all it is doing is, is sapping our emotional strength. It is sapping our physical strength and taking away our time so that we don't have the time or the mental or, or maybe even the spiritual or emotional energy to be bearing fruit. So the bad thing about it is we're not bearing fruit with these people and then we're it's taking away our opportunities to bear fruit with other people. I have a word for people like this. I call them emotional leeches. And in Proverbs 30, verse 15, it says, the leech has two daughters. Give, give. That's all these people do is give me this, jack me up, give me that, and they are never doing anything for themselves. And I talk to people sometimes about being the emotional leeches and talk to them about that this is what you're acting like is an emotional leech. You need to start doing things for yourself because it is physically and emotionally impossible for us to satisfy an emotional leech because uh, uh, 
They have just got to do things for themselves, and we are not going to bear fruit with them. Then, as we continue to see some principles for um, guiding or being a counselor, is we need to take time out to rest. In Mark 6, and this is, this is maybe perhaps just a little bit more of, of, um, of being able to say no, knowing when to say no. In Mark 6, verses 31 through 32, here's Jesus talking to the disciples, and he says in verse 31, he said, and it says, and he said to them, come away by yourselves to a lonely place and rest for a while. Why? It says, for there were many people coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. So here's the apostles have so many people wanting to be taught that they don't have time to eat. Jesus is saying, leave these people here and you come away to a lonely place to rest. And it says they went away in the boat to a lonely place by themselves. But the people saw them leave and you go ahead and read the story. They ran around to where they were going and they got there ahead of Jesus and the apostles. And Jesus felt sorry for them and he went ahead and teach, taught them. Yet the principle is there that, that counselors need to take time out for themselves, time to rest. Ecclesiastes talks about this principle too. Talks about having a balanced life. <clears throat> In Ecclesiastes 4, verses 4 through 6. In Ecclesiastes 4, verses 4 through 6, it says, He says, And I have seen that, that every labor and every skill which is done is a result of rivalry between a man and his neighbor. This too is vanity and striving after wind. So here it is. If you're if you're trying to uh, get more than your neighbor, this rivalry, then that's the vanity and striving after wind. Verse five: The fool folds his hand and consumes his own flesh. One hand full of rest is better than two fists full of labor and striving after wind. So he's talking about balanced life: one fist full of rest and one fist full of, of labor, and then you're going to be uh, more productive. <clears throat> so. Uh, Guidelines for counseling is take time out to rest, and then don't be an emotional garbage dump for other people and their problems. In Proverbs 4, verse 23, there's this general principle of, of, of the counselor, again, taking care of, of herself or himself. In Proverbs 4, verse 23, he says, Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. So he says, you be careful what you put into your mind. And a lot of times, knowing all the things that people do to each other is not good for us. It's not healthy for us. Uh, it's depressing, and it's something that, that tears us down, and it's just not good. Many times it's hard to get some of those things out of our mind. And when we're counseling someone, we don't have to know everything bad, everything he said or did to her, and everything she said or did to him. What we do is we teach the basic principles. The Bible is full of basic principles. The principles of subjection are basic principles. You submit to your own husband as to the Lord in everything. These are basic principles we can teach. And then we let that person apply it to their own life. Now, maybe they may need some, some specifics, but we don't have to apply it to every minute area of their life. We let them do it. We teach the principles. We provide a chance to communicate between the husband and the wife because many times a couple are blinded by their past emotions or their feelings and their intellectual or their thinking experience. They're not communicating with each other. That's why they're in this fix because of their, they're blinded by their feelings and their thinking experiences. And usually they don't listen to each other. Instead, they're just thinking about what they're going to say when the other person pauses for a breath. So one of the biggest contributions a counselor can make to helping someone is helping them learn to communicate. The, 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 the counselor, his feelings aren't involved. He doesn't have all these uh, hang-ups that maybe they brought uh, to their marriage. He can listen impartially. He can tell the husband, now did you hear what she said? And make him repeat it, make sure he heard it. He can tell the wife, I understand what he's saying. Are you listening to what he's saying? Are you hearing what he's saying? And many times, just by a husband and wife learning to communicate, they can solve their problems. In fact, this is what my husband and my, uh, myself find ourselves telling people over and over. You need to learn how to communicate. That's why we've had these lessons on uh, facing his anger and uh, how to fight fair is because communication is absolutely essential. <clears throat> When we lived in Amarillo, <clears throat> we had a lady call that from another town that uh, I don't know how she found out about us. 
But anyway, I think she just wanted to talk to us because my husband was a member of the church and we weren't from her town, so we were kind of like people that didn't know uh, everything. And she could come talk to us about her problem and feel like it was private. So anyway, she called and set up an appointment with us and she came to our house at 1 o'clock and she started talking. And she started telling us how rotten her husband was and how rotten his family was. And this went on for a little while, and so I interrupted her and I asked her, but why are you here? What do you want? And she says, well, I'll get to that in a minute. And so she continued to talk about how rotten her husband was and how rotten his family was. And her husband did this and he flirted with the girls and, and how his, his brother had shot uh, his wife and now he was in prison. And just how horrible they were. So I interrupted her again and I said, uh, why are you here? What do you want from us? And she says, I'll get to that in a little bit. She continues telling us how rotten his family is and how rotten he is. And I interrupted her a third time. I'll, she says, I'll get to that in a little bit. I'll, I'll tell you in just a minute. And she continues. She was there from, from uh, uh, 1 o'clock un until 4 o'clock telling all these stories about how rotten he is, and how rotten his family is. And we still didn't know what her problem was. So finally, my husband says, well, this is Wednesday and we've got services tonight and we're going to have to call this to a halt in 30 minutes, so you can only give you 30 more minutes uh, before we can talk to you because I've got to prepare for tonight. Well, when it came to the time's up, she finally gets down to what the problem is. You know what the problem is? She had committed adultery, her husband had divorced her, and she was telling us how rotten his family was so that by the time she told us what she'd done, then we wouldn't think she was so bad. And now what she wanted us to help her do was help her win her husband back. So you can imagine the first question I asked after listening for three hours to how rotten her husband was, why do you want him back? Oh, he's so nice, and he's got these qualities, and he's got all of these other qualities. and 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 But yet we only had 30 minutes to help her because we had to listen to all these other stories. I mean, you know, I got stories that I could have written the Dallas uh, episode for a year, could have just, just made lots of money writing stories for them about how horrible uh, this family was. But, you know, that was just the biggest garbage, just the biggest amount of garbage. All we were was just a garbage dump for that lady, an emotional garbage dump for her to just dump all kinds of stuff on us that had absolutely nothing to do with her problem, except she wanted to convince us how good she was and how miserable, uh, well, she didn't want to make us think to, her husband was too miserable because she wanted to get back with him, but, but yet to, to clear things with her. So we need to be careful and protect ourselves and to tell people we don't need to hear that. Now, when we continue thinking about counseling, I want us to look at counseling in the New Testament. And when you study the life of Jesus in the, in the Gospels, you find that many times when Jesus was dealing with people, he gave them assignments. He didn't just do things for them and let them go on their way, but he expected them to do things for themselves. And if we're going to imitate Jesus, then one thing we can do is give people assignments. But first of all, we need to realize that Jesus was not 100% successful in his counseling. There were people that, that Jesus talked to and worked with that went on and stayed in their way of sin. So we need to not expect perfection from ourselves as counselors. If we expect to be 100% successful in the people we work with, then we expect to be more successful with than Jesus. Jesus basically helped people who were willing to help themselves. And here's a list of people that Jesus dealt with. Uh, <clears throat> the people that he gave assignments. You remember the story of the ten lepers in Luke 17, verses 12 through 19, uh, where Jesus told them to go to the temple and to show themselves. And on the way, as they were going to do the assignment, they were healed. And uh, then only one of the lepers came back and thanked Jesus. And Jesus says, what? Only one came back, and that a foreigner, uh, a Samaritan. So Jesus gave them an assignment. Then in Mark 1, this is another leper. Let's turn over there and look at that. That Jesus gave an assignment to in Mark chapter 1, verses 40 through 45. Here he says, it says, The leper came to him, beseeching him, and falling on his knees before him, and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me whole. And moved with compassion, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. And he sternly, talking about Jesus, warned him and, uh, and immediately sent him away. And he said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a testimony to them. 
So Jesus healed this leper, and then he gave him an assignment. You go to the priest, and you offer the sacrifice that God has commanded for the healing. Now, this man did not obey Jesus. He went and told everyone so that then Jesus was not able to teach in the cities and go about freely like he wanted to because he didn't obey. You remember the story of the rich ruler that came to Jesus in Luke 18, verses 18 through 23? And he says, Master, what do I lack yet? Jesus says, keep the commandments. The rich ruler says, I've done all of these from my youth up. Jesus told him, there's one thing you lack. Go and sell all that you have and give to the poor and come follow me. And the rich uh, man uh, went away sad because he was very rich. Now, Jesus gave this man an assignment that he was unwilling uh, to do, that God expected him to do. Then you remember the, the blind man uh, in John 9, verses 1 through 7. Uh, this is where God, or not God, where Jesus uh, spit and, and made clay, and he put it on the blind man's eyes, and he told him to go wash. He gave him an assignment, something to go do before he could see. Then there was the lame man in Luke 5, verses 18 through 24. Uh, this is where Jesus was teaching in a house, and the people couldn't get in there with the lame man, so they let the lame man down through the roof. And when Jesus healed him uh, from his lameness, then Jesus told him to get up, to do something for himself. Jesus didn't pull him up. He says, get up, take up your bed, roll up your bed, and go home. He gave him the sign, and he expected him to make the effort to get up. Then there was the man who wanted to bury the dead. He says, Jesus, in Matthew 8, verse 21 through 22, he says, Jesus, wait for me so I can bury my father. Jesus said, let the, the dead bury themselves. You come follow me. So his assignment was to uh, let his father uh, take care of himself. And then there, are, there is the hungry 5,000 in John 6, verses 5 through 66. And we're not going to read all of this, obviously, since there's uh, 60 some verses, but I want us to just hit some high points. This is an incident that where Jesus got very angry that uh, for years I couldn't understand why he got angry. But basically, Jesus, there were 5,000 men. Jesus fed them with just a few loaves and a few fish. And the people were amazed at this miracle. And then they kept following Jesus afterwards. And what they wanted Jesus to continue to do is they wanted Jesus to continue to feed them. They said, like our, like Moses fed our father's manna in the wilderness, we want you to continue to feed us. They thought, hey, this is neat. A guy that's going to come and set up his earthly kingdom, and he can just turn a few loaves and a few fish into food to feed 5,000 men and no telling how many women and children. This is neat. Jesus feed us. And Jesus got very angry with them. And he talked to them about spiritual bread. This is what you need. And do you know these people never got the message? They never understood. And it says from that day forward, many of Jesus' disciples went away and ceased to follow him because he wouldn't feed them, because he expected them to feed themselves the physical food, but to be after the spiritual food. So they failed in that assignment. So this is some examples of where Jesus succeeded with people and some examples of where the people refused. But the main point I want us to see is Jesus gave assignments. He expected people to do things for themselves. Then in the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul taught those who were teachable. In Acts 19, verses 8 through 10, in Acts 19, verses 8 through 10. <clears throat> and this is, in, and when we read this, you think about bearing fruit. In verse 9, or verse 8, it says, And he, talking about the Apostle Paul, entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for how long? For three months, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. So just notice the word reason up here means to think different things with oneself, mingle thought with thought, to ponder, revolve in mind, to converse, discourse with one, argue, discuss. So he's reasoning, thinking things over, pondering them with them. He's persuading. Persuade means to persuade, to induce by words, to believe. So for three months, the Apostle Paul did this with these people. And then it says in verse 9, But when some were becoming hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way before the multitude, he withdrew from them and took away the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannius. So when someone became hardened, that means to make hard, to harden, or to become obstinate or stubborn, he left them. He quit working with them. He worked with them for three months, and then he took the people who were disciples, who were learners, and he went to the school of Tyrannius. And then notice what happened in Tyrannius in verse 10. And this took place for two years. He taught in the school of Tyrannius for two years as opposed to the three months 
uh, in the synagogue. So, and their result, talk about bearing fruit was, so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Gentiles. The Apostle Paul got away from people who weren't teachable. He went to people who were teachable, and he bore fruit so that all the people in Asia, both Jews and Gentiles, heard the word within two, uh, two years. So this is, uh, basically we're seeing that, that Jesus and the Apostle Paul, they didn't just throw their labors and their efforts after people who were unwilling to uh, work and help themselves. Basically what I want us to do is I want us to look at two techniques for counseling. And this is Richard Radke's approach that he uses, and he's very effective in his approach. Richard Radke, when somebody comes to see him, the first thing he says is, if you want to see a lawyer, it costs you about $150 an hour. If you want to see a doctor, it costs you $50 to $100 an hour. If you want to see a psychiatrist, it costs you $75 to $100 an hour. And you're using my time for free. So if you're going to be using my time for free, then I'm going to expect some things uh, from you. I'm not, this just isn't going to be me doing all the work. And Richard uses what he calls the six P's. And so and I don't know if this uh, program is uh, original with him. He's the only person I know of that, that uses it. But in the six P's, the first thing he does is, is the first P is the problem. He has the person condense that problem down into one sentence of about 25 words. So uh, if the man's yelling at his wife or whatever it is, or uh, the wife uh, feels like she's emotionally neglected, whatever it is, it's condensed down into one sentence. So you focus in to the root of the problem. Then the second P is passages. He writes down a few Bible passages that apply to that particular problem, but he does not write down all the passages he knows. He sends the person home, and one of their assignments is to get out of concordance or call other preachers or whatever they want to do, and for the next time they come back to see him, and each time they come back to see him, they have to bring a list of more passages that they have found in the Bible that relates to their problem. Okay, the next P is prayer. They are assigned to pray to God for at least five minutes every day to look at their watch and make sure they pray for at least five minutes. And the reason he has them do it for five minutes is so they get past thanking God for uh, the beautiful day and be with all my relatives and naming all the relatives and, and so on and get down to their problem to praying about their problem, whatever it is. So he gives them the, the time so that they will finally get down to praying about the problem. Then the fourth P is plan. They map out a plan for solving the problem. Uh, how it is they're going to, to go about uh, taking care of the, the specifics of the problem. Uh, for one example he used, he says if a man comes to him and he wants help to quit smoking, then his, part of his plan might be to get more physical exercise so that he feels better uh, about himself and getting oxygen into his lungs and stuff. And to, uh, whatever it is, then they map out a specific plan. Then the fifth P is progress. And this is some kind of a chart like you use with your kids for the jobs that they do where you have the plan laid out uh, on a chart and you have places to check out so that every day that person is to put checks in for when they prayed and the things they followed on their plan and uh, to, when they don't do it then they leave it blank. And so what this progress report does is this enables Richard, when the person comes back to see Richard, they can look at the progress report and they see, can see are we making progress? Uh, if he's trying to quit smoking, well, here it is. He's only smoked uh, so many uh, so many cigarettes one day, and here it is. It's less and less each day. Yeah, we're making progress. Uh, he used the example of <clears throat> if a woman's having problems disciplining her kid. Here it is. I'm having to spank this kid uh, 15 times a day. Well, obviously, that's not good discipline techniques, or she's waiting too long. Something's wrong there. Uh, so by the progress report, the kid starts off getting 15 spankings a day. Uh, now he's down to 10, now he's down to 7, and so on. So you can see that we're making progress. So the progress report uh, is something that's important. Then I thought it was kind of interesting that Richard's sixth P was a penalty. If the person doesn't follow the plan and is not making progress, and not to bring the passages and praying like he's supposed to, then because Richard has donated his time free to this individual and this person is wasting his time by not following through and making progress, then Richard gives him a penalty. May have to treat Richard and his wife out to a steak dinner because it's taking Richard's time away from his wife. And Richard told me that uh, sometimes he assigns men who have a problem with temper. If you lose your temper with your wife, that you come over and chop a cord of wood uh, for me. And he told me he has woke, has woke up in the middle of the night, looked out his window, and there's some man out there chopping wood out in his backyard because he's violated 
uh, his plan is not making progress. So this is something that is uh, effective because it expects that person to do things to help himself or else Richard is not going to be involved in helping that individual. Now, after seeing Richard's plan, I'll show you my approach. There's a lot of things that are similar, only I do it a little bit differently. First of all, I tell the person just right up front, I will spend time with you if you meet certain conditions. And if you are not willing to meet certain conditions, then I am not willing to spend time with you. Because over the years I've learned that people who do certain things, then they get changes in their life and I bear fruit for my time. But if you are not willing to help yourself, if you're not willing to do certain assignments, then I am wasting my time, I'm taking my time away from other people, and I just tell them up front, I will spend time with you if you do certain things. And I usually make a list. I found, I'm, I'm starting to find, I'm just finding this out recently, that if I'll make the list and put it on paper and hand it to them, then, then it gets done better, that's better for them, and that's better for me. Then I have up here, one thing about spending time with people is, I don't take calls in the middle of the night. And this is something, when we lived in Spokane, the church's uh, ad in the Yellow Pages was, was at the front of a church section, so that it seemed that every year on New Year's Eve, in the middle of the night, about 2 or 3 or 4 o'clock in the middle of the night, we would get a phone call from somebody, either a man or a woman, who was bawling and upset because they've been doing their New Year's Eve res- resolutions, their life is disaster, they want to turn their life around, and they want to make things right. And so my husband would get up and talk to them for hours on the phone, and he'd soothe them and call them. And then he'd go have classes with them. And he'd have several classes with them, and they might be baptized. But do you know not one single person who called in the middle of the night ever stuck with it except for a few weeks. They only lasted a few weeks. And so I came to the conclusion that people who do not have enough self-discipline to make a commitment to themselves, I've got a problem and I need help, but I will wait until the morning till a reasonable hour to call. People who do not have enough self-discipline to wait until the morning do not have enough self-discipline to follow through. People who call in the middle of the night unless somebody died, but somebody who calls in the middle of the night just because they're upset and they're emotionally wrought, it's a waste of time. Do not bear fruit. So what I do now, if somebody calls in the middle of the night, we still get phone calls from people in the middle of the night, and they say, oh, I'm upset and I've got problems. I tell them, it's the middle of the night. I will not wake my husband, but if you will call in the morning, then he will be glad to help you. Do you know I've been cussed out by people for telling them that? But they don't call in the morning. Nothing ever happens with these people because they are like the people who change, the unstable, the undependable. And so this is just one of my rules to keep from from wasting my time. If I want to bear fruit, then I don't deal with these kind of people. Then the thing I tell them is, you've got to read these books. I've written these two books on marriage. Uh, and, and if you want me to help you, then this is what you're going to have to do. And I may check certain chapters for them to read first, depending on what their problem is. But what I tell them is, is I have spent a lot of time working on these books. This is my best. And, and I don't have time to tell you every single thing in these books. In fact, the reason we, I wrote the books and the reason my husband helped pay to print them is so that I didn't have to tell everybody everything that was in there time and time again. And so if you will read the books, then, then I am willing to, to spend time with you. And, and one thing that I found in them reading the books is I've got the scriptures there and the definitions, and it saves argument. Because then they're not arguing with me, they're arguing with God because they can see these things for themselves. And then I tell them, do the homework. And depending on what their problem is, if they've got a serious problem, I may say, I want you to do every bit of the homework. Or I may say, you do these parts of the homework because this will this will help you. And then when you come to see me the next time, you have some homework that you're going to show me that you have done this work. You've put this mental effort into becoming a sanctified person. Now this is similar to Richard's approach because part of the homework is goal achieving plans. Uh, for, for laying out, planning what you're going to do. There's progress reports in there to check out. Uh, there's uh, study exercises for you to look up scriptures and to think about uh, what you're doing. So the homework, there's all kinds of variety of homework. Uh, there's more variety in mine, whereas uh, from, from week to week, whereas Richard is each week he expects uh, the same thing. But basically, we're doing the same thing. Uh, I'm not willing to do it all for you. You've got to do part of it for yourself. 
then, depending on the problem, I may list, uh, recommend that they listen to some sermon tapes, they may listen to some class tapes, uh, that, that they need to do that. Then, as I've told you before, I may tell them that they need to get special help. They need to get anger control help, uh, something like this that I'm not qualified to do. So basically, my approach is, I'll spend time with you if you will do these things that show me you are trying to help yourself, and that you're trying to help yourself, then I'll spend as much time with you as it takes to help you deal with this problem, because then I'm not going to be wasting my time. When we were in Santa Maria, we had a young couple come through that were members of the church, but they were not a member of this congregation where we were. They were only going to be there for a few months, and he was there for a job. And the lady came and talked to me and said her husband they had a problem with physical and uh, violence and verbal violence uh, in the marriage. Uh, the police and the welfare, not the welfare, but the Child Protective Service had taken away their baby because they did not want the baby being exposed to violence in the home. So this was a very uh, sad situation. And they came over to the house to talk to my husband and myself, and they sat there on the divan. I told you about this before, and we asked them, how bad has it has it been? You tell us exactly how bad this abuse has been so we know what we're dealing with. And they lied to us and said, well, we just uh, I, he's just shoved her a little bit. He's just used a police hold uh, on her. He's just thrown a few of her plants. Just a few things. That's all it is. And then a, uh, another Christian who lived close to them, and the lady confided in her, uh, she told me that he was chasing her through the house uh, with a knife, that, that when the police had come, uh, he was at, chasing her with a knife. Uh, he had a problem with drugs. He had a problem with alcohol. This was a serious situation. I called the, the shelter. I'd been working with them, going through their training program. I called the counselors there. I said, here's the situation. I need some advice on how to deal with it. And they said, this man is highly dangerous. Uh, and they said, we're concerned about uh, my and my husband's safety in trying to counsel someone like this because he is a highly dangerous individual. After we found this out and my husband and I talked about it, then, we, then I called this fellow up. And I said, my husband has said that you cannot set foot in our house again until you get anger control counseling. You are not welcome to come back until you do this. Now, before, when his wife would try to keep an appointment with me, he'd do things to try to prevent that. And he'd say, oh, I'm going to get anger control counseling. But he wouldn't show up. He was always saying, I'm going to do it. But when it came time to doing it, he was never doing it. When my husband said, you cannot come into our house again until you get anger control counseling, that is the first time we got his attention, and he did get some anger control counseling. But one thing that made this situation very bad was this boy's parents. They lived in San Diego, and he could run home to his parents, and mom and dad would sympathize with him. You just got a bad wife, and she's crazy, and here we're hearing this, you're crazy uh, again. And, and, uh, and they encouraged him, and they put up with his abuse, even though the police are out here all the time continually refereeing the situation. Now, that was a couple that, that really we ended up not being able to help them. We made a little bit of progress with them. In fact, she came. I was teaching the Song of Solomon class, and she came in the Song of Solomon class after I'd been working with her for a while. She walked in the back door, and I didn't recognize her. She was absolutely beautiful. She was radiant. And I thought, that girl looks familiar. I ought to know her, but I don't. And I kept looking at her and trying to figure out who she was, and I finally said, Debbie, is that you? And she says, yeah, it's me. I've been going to AA meetings every night. And I didn't know she had a problem with alcohol, but she'd sobered up and she, I mean, I didn't even recognize her. So they just had all kinds of problems, but we were in a position where we could not apply any peer pressure through the church because they weren't members. And he could continually run home to mom and dad and get encouraged to continue in his sin. And so, so we ended up not being able to help them because they were unwilling to go all the way in helping themselves. Just do a few token things and to continue in what they were. Okay, real quickly, finish up here. I just want to look at real quickly why counseling fails. And I realize we're going a few minutes over, but next week we won't have class, so just a few extra minutes and we'll end up saving the class. Here's why counseling fails. It's because many times the person you're trying to counsel has the wrong attitude towards the counselor, or perhaps the counselor has the wrong attitude towards himself. The person you're trying to counsel thinks of the counselor as a policeman. Uh, the policeman will police the spouse and make the spouse straighten up. Or they view the counselor as a parent. Uh, the parent will take care of things and, and he or she won't have to worry. Or they view the counselor as a friend. Uh, the counselor will take uh, their side against the spouse. Or they view the counselor as Superman. The counselor won't make any mistakes. 
or they view the counselor as a martyr. The counselor gladly sacrificed himself and his family to solve their problems. Or they view the counselor as a genius. He knows all the answers and the counselor won't have to think, or not the counselor, but the person who comes to them won't have to think for himself or herself. And then they review, view the counselor as a religious giant. All things are possible through God, so uh, he, he uh, will have all the right answers to make uh, the person that's come to them happy. So many times people have this attitude towards the counselor, and because they have one of these or several of these attitudes towards the counselor, then the counseling doesn't work because they're not looking up to correct uh, themselves. So as we close, one final point. As we close out our classes, we've been learning about desperate marriages and the sins that cause desperate marriages. And I hope that we can use the things that we've been learning as opportunities uh, to teach other people, make us more aware where our senses are exercised to discern good and evil, and we can recognize opportunities to help somebody. You know, one reason why the Jehovah's Witnesses are such a uh, powerful religious body today is because they are continually going up and down the streets knocking on people's doors. And you know who they're looking for? They're looking for somebody with a problem. Because if they can catch you and you've got a problem and you reach out to them for help and they help you with your problem, then they've got you. They can teach you the Jehovah's Witness doctrines. And so we need to realize that if we can help people with their problems, there's people out there searching for problems. Every time I go to the, the, the shelter in Tacoma and listen to these women talk, one of the things they say is, I need to get involved in a church again. I need to get my life right with God again. These are people that are searching. They know they don't have the answers. And if we don't have the answers for them either, then we're not, we're going to be passing up opportunities and we're not going uh, to be able to help them. Uh, one time I was at a club meeting and I was having to schedule some workers. And one lady came up to me and she said, uh, I'm not going to be able to work this weekend because uh, some people are helping me move out of my house. She says, I'm leaving my husband. She says, my husband is physically abusive. He's been abusive to me all these years. And she says, I've put up with it uh, all these years. But he finally, he broke my daughter's wrist. And she says, I just can't take him abusing uh, my children. And she says, so I'm getting out of there. And I told her, I says, well, I says, I can sympathize with your problem. I said, I have a tape uh, called How to Survive Marriage to a Jerk, and uh, and uh, would you like to listen to it? And so I can't tell you what she said. She thought the word jerk was way too mild, and what she said is not repeatable. But anyway, she says, yes. She says, I would like to listen to that because I've been wondering what the Bible says about this situation. So I had a door open uh, for me there. I told you about my neighbor that my son heard her husband slap her and he came home and told me about it. And then I approached her and said, my son heard this. And, and we talked about it. the door opened because I was more aware of these things. And so we need to, to, we've got our senses trained now to discern good and evil. And we need to, to recognize opportunities that we have perhaps to help somebody in a desperate marriage and to open the door so that we can show them God's love, show them God's mercy, to show them that God really does love women, he cares about them, and that the God that we serve is truly a wonderful God and that we'd like for them to, to enjoy the benefits and privileges that we have with that. Okay, I'm going to stop right there.